and yet it's also a, a book that is foundational. If you know the if you know the four key events and the four key characters in the book of Genesis, you pretty much know the whole book of Genesis. The first eleven chapters of Genesis have to do with four major events: creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. And that's the first eleven chapters of Genesis. But then chapters twelve through fifty have to do with not four key events, but four key characters. And those four key characters are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob's eleventh son, Joseph. Joseph. And Joseph is by far given the most, uh, the most um, attention and, and emphasis by the Word of God. Thirteen whole chapters given to the life of Joseph. And so as we look at Joseph again for a second week this morning, I want to look at a different part of his character. You know, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was a, lived in a time of great upheaval in America, and he said, I can't, I can't do anything about my reputation, but I can do something about my character. He said, if, my, if I take care of my character, then my reputation will take care of itself. And that's true, isn't it, for all of us. And, and if we take care of our character, if we have these crucial character commitments that we're talking about in these five messages about Joseph, then we'll, we'll be able to stand strong. We won't be like a roller coaster all of our life. We won't be going up and down, but, but we'll be able to stand strong. Last week we talked about Joseph's character commitments when it came to his plans and his purposes. The plans and purposes of God. Uh, he was committed to, to following the plans and purposes of God and to trust his plans and purposes. When his plans, when his dreams didn't seem... Uh, to match up with his life, he knew that God was in charge. God was in charge. He was in the driving seat. And so today we're going to be looking at a different uh, aspect of, of Joseph, Joseph's character. We're going to look at Joseph in trials and temptations. Last week with plans and purposes, but now Joseph with, in the midst of trials and temptations. But in the midst of trials and temptations, Joseph had already made some decisions and so he was able to stand strong. Let's read together. Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had bought him down, brought him down thither. Verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was prosperous, he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put in his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Let's stop reading right there. But I want you to realize that nothing can keep Joseph down. Nothing can keep Joseph down. No matter where Joseph is at, it doesn't matter because they, they can put him in a different place, but they can't, they can't put that different place in his heart. In fact, later on when, jo when Joseph becomes prime minister of Egypt, they're going to even change his name. They're going to try to change his name, but they're not going to be able to change his character. Because no matter where Joseph is at, he's always the same. He's a Christian. He's not embarrassed to be a Christian. The Bible says that, uh, that, that Potiphar saw that the Lord, Jehovah, with all capital letters, was with Joseph. How did this man Potiphar know anything about Jehovah God? How did he know anything about Jehovah God? Well, obviously Joseph had said, I serve Jehovah God. And Potiphar saw that Joseph's God was with Joseph. Now sometimes when we get into bad, bad times in life, when we're going through the worst times in life, we might, not, we might be a little bit embarrassed to say, well, I'm a Christian. People might say, well, 
If, if you're a Christian, why is God treating you in such a way? Why are you a slave? Well, Joseph, he said, I'm not ashamed to, be, to call myself a believer in the true God. And, you know, we should be the same way. We shouldn't be embarrassed to be Christians in the, in the world that we live in. We shouldn't be embarrassed by any criticism that we might face. We shouldn't be embarrassed to bow our knee and, and to pray and to thank God in public and, and to talk about our God to other people. We shouldn't be embarrassed. Without God's help, you'll never be we're, we're the Christian that God wants you to be. Uh, Clarence Sexton says it this way. He said, we should all be try to become the Christians that God saved us to be. You know, God didn't just save us to, to go straight to heaven, but he, he saved us to be Christians, to leave us here on the earth and to be Christians here. We should be the Christians that God saved us to be and not, and not, uh, not let, let all that grace and, and all that help and all that uh, presence that the Lord gives us with us in, in the midst of these hard times. We should let all that go to waste. We should, we should allow our lights to shine in the middle of the world that we live in. There's lots of people in the Bible like that. When Daniel was ripped out of his home, ripped out of his culture and dragged, uh, uh, he was dragged 400 miles away to Babylon in 605 BC. Uh, he, was, he was there in the palace of the most bloodthirsty uh, man in the whole world, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but he said, I am going to stand up for what I believe in, and even though nobody here understands it, I'm not going to eat the meat at the king's table. Because it not only did it go against the dietary laws that God gave for Israelites, for God's chosen people, but also he didn't want to say, he said, he's saying, I'm not going to, to fellowship and sit at the table with these wicked people with food that they've offered to idols. I'm not going to do it. And when he was eating with them, he was fellowshipping with them. And you know, there's sometimes there's sometimes you might have to make a stand like that with your friends. You're not going to be best friends with people who who don't understand, who mock the things of God. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar and the people of of Babylon were like. And so they gave, they also gave Daniel a different name. They said, Daniel, your name is now Belteshazzar, named after their gods. But they changed his name again, but they couldn't change his character. They put a different costume on the outside, but they couldn't change what was on the inside. You know, the same with us. You know, people might try to, to mock us, to, 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 change, to, to, take, to call that which is evil good and that which is good evil, but that doesn't change who we are. And so life, life is about these choices, these character choices, the choices like Daniel made, the choices like Joseph made. And life is nothing more than a series of choices, isn't it? Life is nothing more than a series of choices. Sometimes you look back on your life, you know, and, and you think, well, that, it didn't seem like that anything really significant was happening then, but it was because it was the little choices that we make that make us into who we are today. I, I right now, am the sum total of 30 years of little choices that I have made. That's who I am. That's my character. And you, this, you as well. You're the sum total of all the decisions you've made through the years. What you do, what you don't do. Most of the choices that, that, as I said, that made me who I am didn't seem that big at the time, but they shaped my life. But do you know, are you, do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know? Do you, are, you, are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you 100% sure that you're a Christian, that you're a child of the King? That you, do you know who you are? Or are you, is the world always causing you to doubt, who am I? Um, being self-conscious around other people, always hesitant. Or do you know who you are? Dan, uh, Joseph, he knew who he was. He was a slave, but he was also God's child and God was with him. He knew God was with him. And we, so we said in chapter 38 that the name of God wasn't mentioned once in the whole chapter, chapter 38. And it seemed like, uh, like um, all of Joseph's dreams, they, they were lost when his brothers were betraying him. He had, uh, he had brothers who, in uh, chapter 37, I should say, chapter 38 show, tells us the story of, of Joseph's brother Judah and how he, uh, he didn't make these character commitments. He, uh, his brother Judah um, went off into the Canaanite to find a wife of the Canaanites. He fell in love with, a, with an unbeliever. And he had children with that woman, and, and uh, all, all three children uh, were, were no good. In fact, God had to kill two of Judah's three children because they were so evil. That's very rare in the Bible that that happens, but it happened with two of Judah's children that God had. They were so wicked. 
And so, uh, but, but uh, he, he, you can read chapter 38 sometime and just read about all the wickedness that God, I mean, that Judah got into. But in the end, God still, uh, in his great grace, he taught Judah a lesson by the end of chapter 38. And his, his, uh, his final son, um, his final son whose name was Pharez, he was going to be the great-great-grandfather of David and the great-great-grandfather of Jesus. And so he was able to, uh, by God's grace, to be part of the genealogy of, of Christ. And he's the lion, Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah. But even though Judah hadn't made these commitments, God was able to help him to learn his lessons. But he learned the lessons the hard way. But Joseph, he is the opposite. He made the right choices. He didn't ever have to regret anything that he did. He didn't always get rewarded in this at first, right straight away for making the right decisions. He made the right decision and he gets sold as a slave. He makes another right decision and he gets thrown into prison. And yet he could still sleep at night because he has a clear conscience. This, the, the comfiest pillow is always a clear conscience. And that's what we need. But here he is, far from home, a slave in Egypt. He was bought, we're, as we return now to the story of Joseph, we saw last week he was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold to these Ishmaelites, these desert traders, who took him to Egypt, where they sold him to a man named Potiphar, who was the head of Pharaoh's guard, his security guard. And so he's far from home, he's a slave. His brothers, his, his dad thinks he's dead. His brothers have abandoned him. And at uh, the beginning of chapter 39, it's very bleak. It's very bleak. But, and, but still, even though it's so bleak, verse 1 is very bleak. Verse 2 tells us what, the, what we really need to know. It says, and the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Even when life looks bleak, there's one fact that should give us hope that, that life is in the Lord's hands. It's going to turn out well. And sometimes we don't think that our lives are in God's hands by the, by the outside, but we, we can trust the Lord. The Lord's with us. And so that one fact made all the difference. Made all the difference. It made the difference in temptation. And it made the difference with trials. Let's look at that first one. It made the difference with temptation. Joseph was a, a, a slave, but he was completely trusted by his prosperous master. He was, he was a slave. That's the first one, but he was completely trusted by his prosperous master. You know, sometimes when, when life is at its best, that's when the devil attacks us the worst. You know, and, and Joseph, he was... A, he was finally making the best out of a good situation. The Bible says in verse number, th verse number 2, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. He worked hard. He worked hard. You know, some, sometimes you might not be in the best of situations with work or whatever else, but we can still do our best. We can work hard. God prospers that type of attitude. You know, he prospers in integrity and honesty and hard work. And those are things that the Lord can use to, to help us to prosper. The Lord gives us those character qualities. Joseph had already made the decision that he was going to be like that before he had even gotten there. And so many times, uh, we, we, we might find ourselves in a bad situation, but with the Lord's help, it can turn around. In uh, the Nazi concentration camp, who would have thought that something good could have come out of the Nazi concentration camp? Uh, and yet, I, I have a book here about a lady named Corrie Ten Boom. And she was there. In the, in, she was from Holland. Her family, there's a book called The Hiding Place. Her family hid Jew, Jewish um, people in the hiding place in their home. But then she was found out and she was taken to the notorious, she and her family were taken to the notorious Ravensbrook death camp. And she became prisoner number 66,730. And who would have thought something good could have come out of that place? Yet in that place of torment and horror, this devoted and courageous servant of the Lord Jesus decided that, she says, if I had to live in the suburb of hell where the only means of exit for a, for a, a Jew or a Jewish sympathizer was up the smokestack of the crematorium, if death was to stare me in the face every day, if I must live daily with spine-chilling atrocities, if I must be subjected to indignity and intimidation, if I must be foul with vermin, whipped,
forever hungry, terrorized day and night, why then should I, why then can I not be the very best inmate Ravensbrook Horror Camp had ever known? I would be a Christian. So there, in barracks number 28, I held clandestine Bible classes and taught my wretched fellow inmates how to face life and death with Jesus Christ. She made the most of that situation. As a result of her agony, God was able to open up for her in later years a worldwide ministry. And her story's been put into print and, uh, and, and, on the, and uh, in many churches around the world. And it's a major film now shown in movie places around the world uh, for many years. It's, it's, it's thrilled and challenged and encour encouraged countless millions of people. And one day she was even able to meet the, the prison guard that had killed her sister. And she'd been talking in all these churches about how she, was, she had found forgiveness in her own heart for these people and how the Lord had brought her through it. And yet, then yet she was put to the test when she met this prison guard. And he said, I've been, I've been listening to you as you've gone all over the world <coughs> talking about forgiveness that can be found in Jesus Christ. Can you forgive me? And she said at that moment, I, 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 at first, all, all of her human emotions came up as she saw that man who had killed her own sister, and yet, through the Lord Jesus Christ, she was able to show even that prison guard the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so, that's, that's Joseph. Joseph was in the midst of a terrible situation. He's able to show forgiveness to his brothers who've sold him into slavery. He's able to show even the, 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 his master that there's a difference in a Christian. And yet, even when we're strong in the Lord, we need to take heed. We need to take heed because that's when the devil will attack us. So this is also a story not only of, of uh, Joseph's battle with his character, which he'd already won that battle, but it's, now it's going to be a battle with sexual temptation. Potiphar's wife, we don't know her name, just Mrs. Potiphar will call her the rest of the message, but um, she, she was, uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon calls her Madam Bubble. And he says, we, can, we need all resist Madam Bubble and all of, her, all of her advances, all of her promises, because they're nothing but bubbles. And you know what? She came to, uh, her, to this slave Joseph every day. Now, there's a, a, there's a little stand in Tesco uh, near our house in Orton, in, near the Hamptons, and it's a stand outside of Tesco, and it's a stand of all sorts of sweets and candies. And it says on the top, I can resist anything but temptation. That's what it's called. That was a, that's actually a quote from Oscar Wilde. He said, I can resist anything but temptation. You know, in our human selves, that's, that, that proves to be true, isn't it? We can't, we, we can't resist sometimes. We're all sinners. We all have that sinful nature. C.S. Lewis said, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. And we all have that innate sense to go towards sin. And uh, it's because we can't resist temptation that we learn how bad we really are. We all need the Lord. We need the Lord. We cannot face, even though we might be strong, even though we might have made these decisions, even though we might say, have said, I'm going to stay pure until my wedding day or stay pure until I see Jesus. Uh, it's at those high points in life that the devil tries to, to, to bring us to our knees. It was, it was in a perfect Garden of Eden that the devil attacked Adam and Eve. It was the Lord Jesus Christ in his, in his uh, beginning of his ministry that he was tempted by the devil in the desert. Temptation is not new at all. It's been going on. It's been a battle that has touched every single one of us. It's raged for millennium for the souls <coughs> of men. But what is temptation? Temptation, it's not a sin to be tempted, but it's a sin to give in to that temptation. Temptation is an urge from the devil or from yourself, an inner urge to do wrong. And it hits us in the place of our own personal weaknesses. And that's, that's temptation. I like that definition. But uh, it, we, we, when, we, when the devil tempts us to do something, we can't blame our parents if we do it. We can't blame our grandparents. We can't blame our DNA. We can't say, well, that's just my personality. It's all you. You're the only one to blame when you give in to temptation. You can't blame anyone else. Nobody else makes you sin. We do all of that on our own. But there's some principles we need to know from, from the life of Joseph that uh, when we face temptation. The first principle is 
that when things go well, we need to be on our guard when things are going well. Um, this is a very, very familiar verse, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Then the next verse says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So that verse reminds us that while we face temptation, God will always provide a way of escape if we're willing to take it. Every single time you're tempted, there is an escape door somewhere. Your job when you're tempted is to search and find that escape door and get out of it as quick as you can. So many times we see the escape door and we say, well, maybe there will be a second escape door or, or a third one. And, uh, but you know what? There's usually just one, one opportunity to say no. And we have to take that escape door when we see it. When things are going well, uh, this, this, this story of Joseph, he had to be on his guard. So here we have Potiphar. He's the captain of the royal guard. He's the bodyguard. And uh, he's personally responsible for Pharaoh's safety. And at his side, you see Joseph. And as soon as people see Joseph, they probably say, he's different. He's not an Egyptian. He's different. You know what? When you're a Christian standing alongside unbelievers, people will see the difference in you. And Potiphar's wife saw the difference in Joseph. She said, I'm going to try to make him fall. And that's what people do for us. They try to make us fall. He had good looks. The Bible says that his mother, Rachel, was very beautiful. He probably inherited that good looks from his mother, Rachel. He had good look, looks. He had self-confidence. He probably, uh, probably um, he had wisdom, of course. He was able to, to take all, everything that Potiphar had, and it was all blessed with his wisdom. Everything that he had in the house, everything that he had in the field, all of his money, all of his, everything in the field, all of his crops, all of his horses... All of his cat. Joseph was in charge of all of it, and he was a hard-working young man. And uh, and so, Pot Mrs. Potiphar saw that maybe Potiphar maybe Potiphar had uh, had neglected his wife. Maybe he had neglected her. Maybe he was a hard-working man. Maybe he he was at the palace all the time working for for the pharaoh, and he was too tired when he got home to pay any attention to his wife. And uh, plus, maybe Potiphar. Uh, maybe, um, yeah, maybe Potiphar was uh, not as young as he used to be. Maybe he was eating too many big meals at the palace and got a little bit of a belly. Maybe he didn't have as much hair as he used to. And so, so Mrs. Potiphar saw this young man, and but none of those things are an excuse. So many times we say, "Well, Potiphar isn't taking care of of his wife, so maybe maybe she needs some attention." Or, or we come up with all sorts of excuses. Uh, and yet, none of those excuses, we shouldn't even uh, hesitate, we should run from these excuses, run from temptation. And uh, they had a kind of friendship, but verses 2 to 4, I mean, verse, we read verse 2, but verse 3 it says, And his master saw the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. So Potiphar wasn't any dummy, he... He knew the Lord's hand was on this young man. The lost people, they're not stupid. They know when they... Um, they might not understand our doctrine, but they know they can see our hard work. And it's a terrible thing if, if you're a Christian and you don't work hard, because that's a, a bad testimony for Christians everywhere. But I've heard people say in the past that sometimes people, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk, and they just become a bad testimony for Christians. But, but this was a Christian who who had all the principles of life. Now, I've heard in England they're trying to bring in character traits back into the public schools. Why, why have they lost character traits? You know, they're trying to teach character traits because all these character traits, they come from the Bible. They come from, a, a, they come from the Ten Commandments. They come from, from the principles found in the Word of God. So they want, the, they want that back, but, but they're going to be looking for people who carry these character traits. And as Christians, we, we, can, we can talk the talk, but we need to walk it as well. We need to be somebody that, that's different, that stands out. And Joseph definitely, definitely stood out. But when he was tempted, he remembered who he was. Look at verse number 7. 
And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Lie with me. So she, she, the Bible says she cast her eyes upon Joseph. That's an interesting wording there, isn't it? It's like casting a net. Well, she's casting her eyes, and she's following Joseph with her eyes there. And uh, so she had forgot she, this younger man. And as I said before, she, maybe she was discontent with her husband, but, but she didn't just leave it. The Bible says that she was persistent. She was very persistent. Uh, it says there in verse number 8, But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, Joseph there, he remembered who he was. He remembered that he was a child of God. And she came back to him again and again. She tried to slink into his life. She tried to offer him the forbidden fruit of this temptation. But still, he always said, no. You know, why? Why did Joseph say no? So many people say yes in our day and age. So many people say yes. But why did he say no? How could he say no? Number one, he said, first of all, in verses 8 and 9, uh, he was loyal to his boss. He said he refused and said unto his master, like, Behold, my master wadeth not what is with me. And then he was loyal. He says, Because thou art, at the end of verse 9, because thou art his wife. I want you to remember when you see any person that is not your, that is not yours, you should write that in your mind. Pretend there's a sticky note on their forehead. Not mine. They're not yours. This is his master's wife. And so we need to remember that. And we need to be, be faithful to what the Lord has said. But secondly, he was not only loyal to his boss, he was loyal to God. He says in the end of verse 9, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He did the right thing. Why? Because he knew that adultery was wrong. He called it what it was. He called it what it was. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? In our day and age, people like to change the truth of God into something else. That's what it says in Romans 1.25. They've changed the truth of God into a lie. And that's what people do. They, they were assaulted by people who... Who they, they rename sin to try to make it sound less sinful. And uh, Christians are under pressure to compromise our, our convictions. And if we don't if and if we don't compromise our convictions, even if we don't compromise our convictions, we're we're under pressure to keep quiet and to not stand up and call sin what it is. And but we have all sorts of people trying to break into our lives. The Bible says we're uh, we're supposed to be like a well-guarded city, a well-guarded city. And yet, in our nation, the people haven't just gotten through the gate. They're streaming over the walls. They've taken over the culture. And so, in America, there's, there's a saying that says, the Supreme Court isn't. Do you understand what I mean? The Supreme Court isn't supreme. There's a higher court than the Supreme Court. So even if the Supreme Court were to change... Uh, and say this, this, this particular sin isn't really a sin, it's legal now. That doesn't matter. The Supreme Court isn't supreme. There's a higher court. That's God's court. And the, we need to call Bible things by Bible names. You know, instead of using the Bible word adultery, people use words like affair or fling or one night stand or making love. Of course, it's not really that. It's it's lust if it's not inside of a marriage, the way God designed it to be. But instead of renaming sin, we should be like Joseph and remember, remember who we are. We are God's children, and we are supposed to obey what God says and, and trust what God says. And so, instead of renaming sin, uh, they you know you can rename rat poison bread, but that doesn't change it. It's still poison. And so it didn't renaming it didn't change his character at all. He, he refused flatly though, but in verse 10 it says, And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. So 
She continues day after day. But finally, she makes a move. It says in verse 11 that one day he goes into the house to attend to his duties and nobody else is around. It says in verse 11, And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. Now, the reason it, it brings that up is because that was an unusual event. It was an unusual event. Usually, there were other men in the house with Joseph. And that's a wise thing to do, to have other people with you uh, when, so you're not in that situation of temptation. But she schemed it out. She figured out when he wasn't, when there was nobody else in the house, she entered into the scene. And so he had done his best probably to try to stay above reproach, but here comes an impossible situation. She caught him, verse 12, by the garment and uh, saying, lie with me. So what's he going to do now? It's the moment of truth. He belongs to God. And uh, if, if he says no, he's probably going to get thrown in prison. He could have said, well, you know, she's the master's wife. If I, if I do what she says, maybe I'll have an easier time in the house. Maybe she'll help me with this or that. He had nothing, nothing, to, nothing humanly speaking to lose by doing this with Potiphar's wife. It would only benefit him, but, but he had a lot to lose if he said no. Physic from human perspective, he could have been thrown into prison, which is what... But he had already made the decision long before. When you're tempted with something, there's no time, there's no time to think about it. There's no time to pray about it. You know, we should already have prayed about it. We should already have made the decision long before, before the temptation comes. That's the only way you're going to avoid it. He didn't mess around. He didn't flirt with trouble. He didn't say, well, how far can I go with this? He just said no, and he ran away. He had to act fast. When, te when you are tempted, that's the third thing that we learned from Joseph. When you are tempted, you need to act fast. The end of verse 12 says, And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Got him out. So, he, like I said, he could have said, Well, we're alone. No one will ever know. That was true. He could have said, She made me do it, which that would have also been true. He could have said, no one else will ever know. It was probably true. He could have said, uh, she's in a bad marriage. That was true. He could have said, well, I sing, I'm single and I have needs, you know. But uh, that, that's, uh, that's true. But he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, allow any of those lists of excuses to mess with him. Uh, he could have said, everybody fools around, you know. That's not true, but it's a nice excuse that people use. He could have said, well, God will understand this once. Well, that's definitely not true. But that's a popular excuse as well. Uh, it was all or nothing. He he ran away. There was a boy once, and uh, he had uh, gone on the on the train in London, and he came back with a shilling, and he said uh, the, the the man had had uh, given him a shilling back in in change, mm -hmm. extra. So he went back to his dad and said, "Yeah, I got an extra shilling." <coughs> he said, "Next time I won't have to pay." And his dad was shocked. He said, "Son, would you?" Would you sell your character for one shilling? And you know, that's the truth, isn't it? Some people sell their character for one little thing. And uh, But Joseph, he was determined. He wasn't going to sell it for anything, even if it cost him his freedom. So he ran away. And when you do right, the fourth thing we learned from, from uh, Joseph is that when you do right, everybody's going to be happy. No, that's not the case. When you do right, we're not always going to be rewarded straight away. Uh, William Congreve said, he, uh, no, it says, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And so here's this woman, she's been scorned, and she says in verse number 13, and it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, see, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. She's got a little bit of racism there in her voice. And it says, He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So she makes up this false accusation. She pretty much says that Joseph had attempted to rape her, and she's completely lying. It was a false accusation. But then, in verse number 19, he was unjustly imprisoned. It says, And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, 
which he, he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Here's a Hebrew boy in an Egyptian prison with no lawyer, no chance of appeal. He's been put into prison, but he's he still has his character. Sometimes, sometimes uh, when the world uh, doesn't understand us, when just as they did with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified by the world, and so we shouldn't expect to get off with anything easier than that. You know, when, but when you do right, the world will not reward you. But the last principle is, when you do right, God will honor you. Look there at verse number 21. It says, But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. You can't get Joseph down. You just, just think about the fact that he didn't please people. He didn't please Potiphar's wife. And so many times, that's going to be true of you and me. You know, all of us, we want to make people happy, don't we? If I said I didn't want to make you happy, I'd be lying. I do. I want you to be happy with me. That's true. But there's something, there's someone even more important that I want to please. And if, it, and if something that I do doesn't please God, I shouldn't care what you think about me. You know, Kevin was with us this weekend, and he uh, he came out he came out with us on the, he came out with Mr. Pavin on Monday into the city center, and a lot of his friends didn't understand that, and they were unpleased with him for uh, for for spending his energy on that type of thing. That's what he had said he wanted to do even when he was in the hospital, and yet people don't understand it. But there's somebody else who's pleased, isn't there? Somebody else is pleased. That's that's who we should all want to please. There's a I can't remember the name, but um, the name of the, the man. Uh, but Notre Dame used to have a, a great coach called Vince Lombardi, and uh, he was the coach of the of the team. And I can't remember the name of the two players, but he was one of the most famous. I'm not great at American football, but but uh, one of the one of the the quarterbacks was one of the most famous football players who had ever played football. And yet he had said to his there was a man who was supposed to guard the quarterback. And, uh, and so Vince Lombardi said to that little, that man who was guarding the quarterback, he said, the whole game rests upon your shoulders. And so uh, after everything was done, uh, the, the, the play was made, and they, it was, they, they had to score at least more than three points to win the game. It was the last few seconds, and they scored a touchdown. Uh, that, that man had protected the quarterback, and the quarterback had gotten in, and uh, that, that man got up, he said, the, the coach had said, the whole game rests upon his shoulders. So he got up expecting the whole crowd to be shouting his name, but instead they were shouting the name of the quarterback. And nobody had even noticed what he had done, but the whole game had rested upon his shoulders. And so he got up and everybody, the whole crowd was, was shouting the quarterback's name. They had lifted him up. They had all ran off into the, into the, uh, into the locker room shouting the quarterback's name. And, and he just... Uh, Got up, wiped off the the sweat and the blood off of his off of his face, and he started limping towards the sidelines. And nobody knew he was even there. They were, all their eyes were somewhere else. But there was the coach, Vince Lombardi. And when he saw the coach, the coach went, and he said, "That's all I needed." The coach had seen it, and that's who we need to please. We need to please God. And one day we're not we might not get the applause of men here on the earth. But one day we'll get the applause of heaven and the applause of God if we do the right thing. You know, Joseph, he wasn't rewarded on earth. Psalm 105, which Rudy read to us at the opening of the service, it says that God sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us that here in Genesis, but it says that they put his feet in fetters and iron in the prison. And it says, until the time... That his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. There's that word tried. That's the title of the message, trials and temptations. What are you going to do in trials and temptations? Are you going to trust the Lord? Are you going to stand for what's right? Are you going to make these character commitments that nobody can take away from you? They might even give you an, uh, make, make fun of you and give you a new name <laughs> at work like they did to, um, 
Joseph. You know, you might be called Goody Two Shoes or or a preacher or, or whatever they might call you, but they can't. They can change your name, but they can't change your character. And so there's some <coughs> things that are worse than going to jail. Uh, some things are worse than going to jail for doing right. You know, when uh, when John Bunyan was in jail, out came Pilgrim's Progress. When uh, when John went to the exile on the Isle of Patmos, out came the book of Revelation. You know, some, some great things can come out of jail. And so he was in jail. Chapter 40, we're going to look at next week. Chapter 40 starts with him in jail. And chapter 40 ends, and he's still in jail. And yet he had to wait. And a lot of time, next week we're going to talk about waiting. Waiting. How, we, what, what do you do? when you wait. Come back next time and you'll see some amazing things that happen to Joseph, even while he is waiting. Uh, but then, look, we never read verse 23, the last verse in, in, in uh, chapter 39. It says, The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that his, uh, was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, and the Lord made it to prosper. The Lord is on our side. He's with us. We need to do what's right, even if the stars fall, as Bob Jones Sr. used to say, do right. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this example of this young man who served you in the most dangerous, hopeless, pagan of all situations, but he was unashamed to serve you anywhere. Father, I pray that you'll help us as Christians. We don't know where we'll be next year or in five years or even tomorrow. Uh, for sure, but Father, we know that uh, if we're serving you, we know who we are in Christ. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who's, who's not a Christian, who doesn't know for sure who they are in Christ, who doesn't know for sure that they're going to heaven, that they'll put your, their faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who is a Christian, that they won't be bitter and jealous like Joseph's brothers and not able to serve you, but may they be, uh, may they not be bitter. May they not allow these trials and temptations to make them bitter, but may we all allow them to make us better. Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ who went through the ultimate suffering for us. Father, we pray that you'll help us to, to not be ashamed, not be embarrassed, to not be cowardly about standing up for you. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Well, you might be weary and troubled with life, so let's sing page 204.